I'm Jeremy Morgan, and I'm a Pluralsight author, and I've built about five courses for Pluralsight and IT ops. Um, I've been a developer professionally for around 20 years, um, worked with a variety of companies from, you know, little startups that couldn't keep their lights on to Fortune 100, and I've spent the last several years as a DevOps engineering consultant, uh, mostly in the Windows space. And now I'm a technical marketing manager here at Pluralsight. So today we're going to talk about ways to make your releases less scary, less painful, and most of all, less risky. So today we're going to talk about environments. We're gonna talk about the deployment itself, um, optimized release structures, and then I'll open it up for some questions. So let's get started. Now this quote describes digital transformations perfectly. So we need to slow things down in order to speed things up. And the idea is a little bit of effort now for less effort later. Now it's easy to get bogged down in the details and, and start to feel helpless and get overwhelmed. I, I've been there before, but if you keep your eye on the prize and put in some effort into your continuous delivery strategy, your future self will thank you. So we talk a lot about DevOps these days, um, kind of blurring the line between developers and operations. Many organizations have a, a stretch goal of it being only one single group. And a lot of people talk about, you know, just one group, no more developers or operations. And to me personally, I think these two camps will always be separate and there will always be somewhat of a silo in every organization. And that's okay. Like it's okay to have developers develop things and operations people keep things running. What we should strive for is better cooperation between the two groups. So if you have one person that can straddle the two or a few people that can do developer stuff and ops stuff, that's great. But uh, personally, I, I think the goal of trying to make everybody do everything is a little bit unrealistic. So if you have somebody that is kind of on both sides of it, they'll likely be commanding like deployment tasks and deployment is the bridge between these two groups. It's kind of the proverbial wall that we talk about and so we're focusing on deployment here in this webinar, webinar because it's important. Without this bridge, we have developers building things that never see the light of day. And without operations folks running things, we have nothing to put it on. So it's important because it's, it's often the biggest bottleneck in your flow. Failures and efficiencies here are felt through the whole organization. So we're gonna focus on some ways to improve deployments and we wanna free up those bottlenecks and reduce risks in this crucial area. Now, many of you will remember that we used to have big pizza parties to do big deployments, right? The big 1.0 to 2.0 deployment is here. Let's eat some pizza and pull the lever and we'll spend the rest of the night and weekend kind of mitigating problems. You know, if we're lucky, we'll come back to the office frazzled on Monday morning and version 2.0 will be up and then we can start answering all those support tickets. It wasn't much fun. And so early in my software, early in my career as a software developer, this was kind of the normal. And for some people, it may still be, but there's a better way of doing things now and just takes adjustments and, and changes. You'll have to do some things that are different before and some things are really counterintuitive. So I say no more pizzas for deployment, no more cakes celebrating the big release. Uh, deployment should be a non-event, should be something that we just don't worry about anymore. So when I first started a job as a software engineer at a major tech company in 2008, it was about six months before any of my code saw the light of day. So basically the first day I sat in my chair to the time that code was being used by a customer was about six months. And it was a big, huge release and completely painful to say the least. By 2013 at that same company, I would write code and it would be tested and delivered in about three days. So we still did Friday deployments, but it was much easier to do with the with that smaller bite size. And I was pretty impressed by how quickly releases changed in, in these few years and they're way faster now. So in order for deployments to be successful, they need to have three things. They need to be automated. You have to be able to automate anything you can and this improves the speed of delivery. And of course it's, it's far easier said than done, but you should automate everything possible. It should be repeatable. Now this is important for stability. You have to be able to repeat the process anytime you need to. Repeating the same deployment over and over should not change the state of your system. And most of all, it should be predictable. So if your deployments are automated and repeatable, they'll be inherently predictable. You should know what's going to happen every time you push the button. So how do we get there? That's what we're gonna talk about today. Now imagine you've just been hired as an engineer at Globomantics and you're in charge of deployments and delivery of the company's software. So Globomantics has had a system in place for delivering software for years and they're now in the mid middle of a digital transformation. 
Their competitors are putting pressure on them the last few years by pumping out features faster than ever. So naturally, Global Mantics has to make some big changes to produce software faster, which is why you're here. In order to deliver it faster, you can't have every other deployment break and you can't put your company at risk. Now to understand how to make deployments better, we have to step back a little bit and look at the big picture. Deployments are a direct reflection of your batch size. Now a big deployment is a result of too much work being put into a single push. Now altering our batch size will reduce the risk with our deployments. And let's take a look at our overall flow. Now it starts with an idea and this usually comes from the backlog or, or somewhere like that. And the idea can be, here's a new feature or let's fix this bug. But either way, it's an idea. Now, once a developer has agreed to work on it, it goes into the development phase. And this is where the actual coding and work is done. Once a developer completes the code, they push it into the testing phase. And here we have a set of unit tests, integration tests, and things like that, that make sure the new code works with the system. After that's complete, it goes into staging. And this is where we can see how the code is really going to integrate with our system and try to catch regressions and things like that. And if everything is good and signed off, it goes into production. Now, hopefully our staging and production are configured identically so nothing breaks here and we'll get into that. And then finally, we have delivery. This is when the customer actually starts to use the feature. Now in many workflows, pushing into production means it's delivered, but I'm intentionally keeping these separate here and you'll see why later. The big idea here is we wanna look at this entire process and the speed at which it moves in a system. Like how long does it take to go from idea to delivery? Is it a month? Is it a couple weeks, a few days? This is important because we want this to be as fast as possible. Now bottlenecks in this process will slow down that flow. And where do we usually find bottlenecks? It's in the transition between these parts. You know, anytime the code moves from one stage to another or the artifacts move from one stage to another, you have a potential for bottleneck to occur. Now the top things that create bottlenecks here are moving the manual code in a manual process. Anything that requires human intervention, things like that, it's prone to breaking. So if the flow is slowed at any of these points, the entire process is slowed. You'll have people waiting on something to be complete before they can move theirs forward, things like that, and that's pure waste. So what's the first step in reducing these bottlenecks and increasing your flow? In my experience, the biggest and easiest thing to change is batch size. So let's look at a large batch size release, right? At Global Manix, we have a team that does a release at the end of each sprint. We had to add in a database migration that our DBAs wanted. Now this is a schema change that needed to be made. We had some additions to the UI during this time and, and at the request of customers who are kind of dissatisfied with the current layout. And some engineers noted performance problems with our API. So they did some behind the scenes refactoring to speed up queries. And then finally, we had a business logic issue that affected a few customers and we found a fix. And this is what a typical sprint could look like for any team. You know, and we're happy that we got so much done, but think about how many dependencies we can see here. Think about what the deployment portion will look like. So when we push this all at once, we hope for the best. And what are some things that are likely to happen here? Well, as we try to push all these changes through, we're taking a big risk. What will it take to get all these changes to delivery without problems? And there are many things here that can go wrong. For instance, a database migration may fail and it could take days to sort out and troubleshoot. So during this time, the UI, API, and business logic changes we have, all of those stay in wait. And this is wasted time. It's kind of the equivalent of having items sit on the shelf at a grocery store. These are features and fixes. You've already put money, effort, and time into them and they're just sitting in a waiting state. So the engineers involved will be waiting on you too. And what's the cost of that to your organization? When you push deployments with large amount of change, you increase the chances of risk. So in addition, like the UI changes might change the behavior in unexpected ways. The refactored API might conflict with the database migration. And it's kind of similar to balancing your checkbook at the end of the month. You know, the more often you, you do it, the better off you are. So if we break down each job individually and deploy that, it becomes much easier to manage. So let's look at our database migration. Now, how long will it take to push this through? We have a batch size of a single item and it's a single task with changes. We'll know right away whether it works, if it breaks, things like that. And if it does break, we can roll back and address the problem quickly. There's a lot fewer regressions here. For instance, if we push a database migration all by itself and then a service fails somewhere else, we'll know immediately that it likely had something to do with that database migration. 
if we go back to that big batch push that we just did, it could be any of those things that caused this service over here to break. So using the previous batch size examples, um, we kind of see that there's a lot of dependencies there and it's a big bunch and this is just one thing that you need to go through. Now what this means is you'll need to do more than one deploy per sprint, which is exactly the idea of daily, weekly, or even hourly deployments. And it's the core of continuous deployment, several small changes instead of a large set of changes. And you need to look at branching as well. So as your developers have these long lived branches where they add feature after feature, bug fixes, tons of changes over a long period of time, this causes problems because as that branch is open, other developers are creating branches and merging as well. If that developer doesn't pull in the changes frequently, when they go to merge that long branch, there's gonna be conflicts and problems present. So don't allow these long lived branches to go on through all these multiple features. You wanna tie the branch to the task. So how do we reduce our batch size? This one's, you don't need any fancy tools or tech or anything like that, it's strictly a human thing. You need to break down your tasks and stories. So each of these should be refined to a point that it's as small as it can get. And this can be challenging when a bug fix involves multiple parts of the application. And in that case, you will have to do a larger deployment. But if possible, you wanna tie one story or task to a commit and deploy. Now, if you have a feature you wanna add, make it a single story or task and then deploy those changes and those changes only. So you won't have the, the long lived branches problem because that branch will have to be committed in order to go through and do the deploy. And then you need to prioritize your tasks. And this is another strictly human effort. You know, as you break down the tasks into smaller chunks, you need to decide what's most important to tackle first, because if everything is top priority, then nothing is top priority. So one way to prioritize your tasks is using a method that's found in the safe agile framework. And first you need to look at the cost of delay. What would happen if you didn't do this task? And you look at how long it takes the task to complete. So I'll explain a little bit deeper. We need to find out what our cost of delay will be. Like what would happen if we didn't do this task? So what is the business value? Is this a task that adds features that our customers will use? Is it fixing an issue they have? Is it something that drastically improves the software or is it kind of a small change? And how quickly does it need to be done? Is this something that needs to be done right this second or can it wait? Is the cost of waiting very expensive? Does waiting to accomplish it cost money or waste resources? And then finally, does this task reduce our risk? So does it reduce the risk or open up an opportunity that we would like? Is this a bug fix that will add security to the application or is it a feature that will enable better sales? You take all of these into or consideration when determining the value of the task. And using these metrics, some tasks will have more value than others. And then we look at the job duration. And this is an estimate of the effort required to complete the task. We have time to build, which is of course a big metric. How long will it take to build this? Will it be days, weeks? Um, you need to do your best to scope out how much time it will take. And then what are the resource needs? This can be done by one engineer, this can be done by several engineers, this will require several teams. And then finally, you have to consider the change requirements in the size. Will performing this task require changes from other groups or major changes in other parts of the software? And this is how you'll determine your job duration. So to determine what to prioritize first, you have to look at the job duration versus the cost of delaying it. What tasks have a high cost of delay with the shortest amount of time to complete them? That's what you'll tackle first. And this is an oversimplified explanation of weighted job shortest first, and it doesn't apply in every single situation, but it's a great way to start prioritizing some of those tasks. So your first steps at Global Manix should be to work with your developers. Whether they're using Scrum or some other methodology, um, you need to sit down with them and break down the tasks. So each story or task should have a single definitive action. Try to make each task deployable. Now this is not always possible, but if you can, make each task a deployment and then prioritize those tasks so you can get the best efficiency right up front. Now, the next thing you need to look at before even addressing your deployments is environments. And what I mean by environments is just the place where the software lives, whether it's a server, container, or application instance. These environments usually live in stages like development, testing, and production. In order for your environments to work for you, they need to be set up properly. 
And this isn't as easy as setting up a couple machines under a desk and telling people they can put their software on it like we used to do in the old days. You need to be very deliberate and methodical in setting this up. They need to have consistent configurations, be self-service, and then repeatable. So we're all pretty familiar with this setup for deployment, right? The, the developers build the software on their local machines and it, it's on the development server. Once they've de deemed it ready to push to staging, they'll push it to staging to be tested. Then once it gets tested, it gets pushed to production. So nothing new or mind blowing here, but let's talk about some of the anti-patterns with this setup that I've seen in the past. In this case, we'll assume that this is a web server for Globomantics. Let's look at our production server. Now it's obviously set up to run the software our customers or users see and interact with. It's connected to a production database with real data. And it's configured a certain way to make each of those applications work. The first anti-pattern here is Globomantics sometimes makes changes on production to fix things or add things without going through the, the SDLC process. So if a config change is needed, there's several people who can go in and change it and then document it later, maybe. Our Globomantic staging server is mostly like production. It's configured similarly and connected to a database that looks like production, but it doesn't have any real data in it. So there are a few config changes here and there, and the code isn't exactly the same as it is in prod because we just manually copy over the artifacts and test our area of code. And here's the Globomantix development server, which is nothing like production or staging, but it's a good place where you can toss a few binaries on it and send it to someone to look at. Most of the time, the developers don't use it because it's nothing like production or staging. You'll even hear some of the developers say, don't use dev for anything, just push it to staging to test it out. So this is exactly what I've found frequently in, in my years of consulting, and this probably sounds really familiar to you. It's easy to fall into these habits, um, especially if you're just trying to get the job done, but there's better ways to do it. So let's look at the anti-patterns that we've seen so far. So far we've seen inconsistent configurations, right? They're different on development, staging, and production. And then we have manual processes. So most of the time developers build the application and then they just kind of copy the files over as they need to go. And then we have isolated changes, meaning sometimes we change things on staging or production to make it work. And then maybe those changes happen later in staging development, but usually they don't. So let's look at a better setup. A better setup would be something like this. We have our production server and its configuration is treated just like code. It's stored in a safe place and it retains a state. So every configuration that's made to the server that's needed for the application will be stored. Now, if you wanna make a change to the configuration, you can't just log in and change it. You'll have to submit a pull request to change anything on the server. So you might be saying, wait, I wanna produce software faster, but now I'm gonna to have to go through a change board and approvals and all this stuff. And yes, yes you do. And we're not adding useless red tape here though. Our staging server is configured exactly the same as production. We're using different certificates and scrub data and things, but the configuration itself is the same. Anything that works on staging can be reliably expected to work in production. And in fact, we even use the same set of binaries in staging as we do in production so that we know that it works. If it breaks, our customers will never know it. And here I'm introducing a dedicated testing server. This server is configured exactly the same as staging and production but this is just for running unit tests, unit acceptance tests, other types of integration tests. And it's the first stop for finding out how your changes are gonna affect the system. Now here's something interesting about the testing server is it doesn't even have to exist as a traditional server. It can be something that the developer just decides to spin up for this project. And then finally, we have the development server. It's configured the same as production also. It can be spun up as a VM if needed, so, um, similar to the testing server. So we have these four servers and let's look at how the workflow for our Global Manix developers will be. So our Global Manix developer is starting a new task and she pulls down the source code from the repository and creates a branch. Now as she's developing, she may push, to, push the artifacts to dev several times just to see how it reacts. And it may be an environment where it won't run locally on our machine, so we'll push it up to dev. Now here we can either have her commit the code to a dev branch to be built or just build the files locally and manually push them. Manual processes here are okay because it, it's gonna match the cadence and style of the developer. Some developers really like to iterate quickly and so you don't wanna tie that up with a, a process. So manual deployment here is perfectly okay. 
Now, since we may need to debug these files, they'll be built with debug symbols or you know, be unminified JavaScript, something like that, because these won't be the artifacts that we actually use in production. So she does a spot check on it and everything works fine. Once she's determined that the feature is ready to test, she commits the code into the repository and then those artifacts can be tested. In the test environment, we have the same set of artifacts, but now they're going to be in testing. Here the developer can test them and these should be automated tests as well if you can. And you may have dedica dedicated testers working here, other engineers that do tests. This environment should be configured exactly like production or as close as you can get to production. So any settings that production needs to run the software should be set here. And in fact, you should be able to create a button or push a button and create a test environment that's a replica of production. Making these VMs freely available to developers will help tremendously. And as long as we have passing unit tests and integration tests, it'll be ready to move on to staging. Now, whether or not these artifacts are debug artifacts or um, release artifacts kind of depends on your organization. Some teams like tests to run against production level artifacts. And if that's the case, then the, the same files are gonna be used on production. But if your testers want debugging, they won't be the same. So if all our tests pass and we deem it ready to go to the next level, it should be one simple button push. And now our artifacts are in staging. These artifacts should be built by a build server with no debug symbols or files, um, no unminified JavaScript, anything like that. These artifacts and files should be the exact ones that we're going to use in production. And this is the last place for a good spot check. So the server is configured identically to production, so you should be able to run smoke tests, UI tests, integration tests, anything you want, and it should run fine. Anything that pops up here is obviously going to pop up in production. So if all the tests pass, we submit a pull request and it goes to development. And now the artifacts have been pushed into production and hopefully it was an automated push. And these are the exact same artifacts we just had in staging. Um, production and staging are configured identically. So we have no reason to believe that this new version of the software won't work as expected. Now there are exceptions to that, of course, but following this, de this deployment pattern makes deployment simple, easy, and predictable. So let's look back at what we want from environments and see how this model stacks up. We have consistent configurations. We're storing our configuration in our product, of our production server as code. We can do this with things like Terraform, Chef, Puppet, SaltStack, uh, many other software packages. If we're operating in the cloud, we can use things like uh, AWS Cloud Formation, Azure Resource Manager, Google Cloud Deployment Manager, things like that. Now, I haven't mentioned containers in this because containers to some extent solve this problem for you with environments, but the process is similar. You'll push a container instance through different phases in a similar fashion. And we want these to be self-service. So this, this new environment that we just set up is self-service. So remember how I mentioned the developer can create her own environment, like her own test or development environments? This is crucial. So if your developers can spin up a VM or an instance that's configured just like prod with the push of a button, you enable self-service that saves time for that developer and for the operations staff. You shouldn't have a long drawn out process. And you know, instead of sacred servers with names and limited access, developers should be able to create an environment and then throw it away when they're done. And then finally, it needs to be repeatable. So if you follow the guidelines that we just talked about, this should be repeatable at any time. You should be able to run deployments over and over without changing the state of the server or any of the services. And it should be something that a developer could do multiple times an hour if they wanted to. As long as your configurations are the same and enough processes are automated, you should have a low uh, amount of mistakes here. So your next steps as a global Manix release manager should be to Create configurations. This is very time consuming, but it's worth it. Create a configuration for your production servers. And this configuration, as I said, should be stored as source code, whether it's a, just a PowerShell script that sets things up or um, some other kind of like the packages that I mentioned. So anyone should be able to take a new OS install, whether it's Windows or Linux, and automatically configure a machine or instance that's exactly like production. And we'll want to add, automate everything we can. So if you build a create a build server, you can use it to build artifacts when you check in code. And this is the best method to eliminate human error. Plus, if, if there are any tricks to make it work, so we've all seen the, well, you have to do this flag and this and then move this to make it work and then it'll build. If you have anything like that, it has to be included in the automation for it to work. So you have less things that are stored in, in tribal knowledge or outdated documents. 
And finally, we want to allow self-service. We want to allow the developers to create their own environments. And this can make some security and operation folks kind of cringe, you know, but it makes life easier for everyone involved if the developers can create their own environments to develop and test. And to take that a step further, anyone should be able to build. So anyone on the team should be able to create artifacts from source control and then deploy to any environment, even production. Anyone should be able to run tests on their local machine or in a testing environment. And anyone on the team should be able to deploy code anywhere. You should have enough testing and safeguards in place to prevent one person from kind of taking down everything. And it's a lot of effort to get there, but it's worth it. It allows your team to be as flexible and efficient as possible. So let's take a look at deployment. Deployments can be the scariest thing an engineer does in their job, and it shouldn't be. Remember, some organizations deploy multiple times per hour. So it's said that Amazon deploys code like every 11 seconds or so, and your organization probably doesn't need to deploy every 11 seconds, but you should still adopt some of those same principles. In the 2019 State of DevOps report, several companies were surveyed. And out of those companies, the companies that were considered low performers deployed between once per month and once every six months. Medium performers were between once a week and once a month. High performers, they deployed once a day and or once per week. But the elite companies were on demand multiple times a day. Now, it's pretty easy to say we need to deploy multiple times a day, but it's not really easy to make that happen. So how do we bring global mantics to this elite level here? There's a few things that we need to expect from our deployments. We need packages that are suitable for deployment, that are automatically built. This means pressing instead of pressing build in Visual Studio and copying the files to each server, we need to have an automated process to build from source control. All of the artifacts on your server that run your application should be built from source control. So things like file-based databases, cached files, user uploaded content, et cetera, those don't fall into this category. These are just the packages used to run your application. And as I've mentioned before, it should be a self-service method. You should have a push button automated way to deploy the code into production. And it's not just for convenience because uh, most importantly, it eliminates the risk of human error. Automated push button methods prevent the tricks and workarounds that uh, sometimes happen from creeping into your process. And then finally, all changes should be recorded. So all of the commands that were run and their results and Things like that should be recorded into a log. This is mostly for compliance and auditing, but it also helps you backtrack if you've had a problem. So let's take another look at our environment here. We'll add in a couple servers, a source control server and a continuous integration server. Now, ideally with this type of flow, this is what we'll wanna create for Global Manix. The developer pulls down the source code from the source code repository and starts making changes and it can be pushed back and forth to dev as needed to develop it. Once the developer decides it's ready to test, she commits it back to the source code server. And then the CI server will pick up that change and build a package to test and deploy it. So automated tests are run by the CI server, and if they fail, the build's rejected and the developer and possibly others will be notified, so they'll have to start the process over again. If it passes, then a production-ready package is built and pushed to the staging for another set of tests. And these can be demos for people, user acceptance tests, um, other types of human-based testing. Once that passes, it's pushed again, and the CI server takes that same package and pushes it into production. And all of this can happen within an hour. So to get this done, you'll need to implement a continuous integration server which is easy to say, but it's not cheap. So if your organization can't afford to build a huge set of CI servers, you can build in automation in-house. Um, something like Bash in Linux, PowerShell in Windows, you can create a lot of, of really good things. So a uh, CI server is something that's nice to have, it's great to have, but if you're not able to have it, you can do a lot of this stuff through PowerShell or Bash. We wanna automate the integration, automate the testing, and automate deployment. And again, this is convenient for developers and operation folks to automate things, but the biggest benefit aside from that is just eliminating human error from these processes. Now with this completed, we're fulfilling the five steps to building a leading DevOps practice that I wrote about on the Pluralsight blog. So let's recap those steps. Step one is reducing your batch size, which we've done by breaking down our tasks into smaller chunks and then deciding to deploy for each of those tasks. Step two is to create high fidelity environments. 
And these are the predictable statically configured environments that we talked about. Step three is to automate integration, deployment, and testing, which we've done with the CI process. Now these steps are a lot of work. So it's, it's super easy to sit here and say, just automate all of these things. It's always a lot of work, but it's well worth it to get your features out to customers in today's fast pace. And let's take a quick look at delivery, which can be entirely different from deployment. So deployment and delivery are two separate things, and I think they should be. Depending on your organization's needs, you may want to decouple the deployment and delivery completely. So when I talked about flow in the beginning, I intentionally put a delivery phase in after production. You remember this. Um, just because you put something into production doesn't mean the customer can actually use it. Now, while many organizations use push to prod to make it live for everyone, and they, they use that model, there are times when other patterns will be helpful. And these are environment-based releases or application-based releases. So with a blue-green deployment pattern, we have two different production environments, blue and green. We have our database, applications, and websites divided between those two environments. Both of them are configured exactly the same and hopefully with automation. So here we show the customers going into the green environment. And this is our production environment. Now, as we build a new version of the software, we push it into the blue environment. So here we can test it, play around with it, and kind of make sure that everything works properly. Once we're satisfied with that new release in the blue environment, we use a router to switch our traffic over to blue, which is now production. We allow the users to use the new software, try it out, and if it works, we'll leave it there and we'll deploy our next release into green. If something fails or a problem start, we can always flip the switch and go back to green. Like if we move it to blue and, and all of a sudden things start to break, we can just go right back to green and then work on the release that's in blue. Now, another variation on this is the canary pattern. And this is named after the canaries that coal miners used to take into the coal mine. And if there were deadly gases in there that killed the canary, then they'd know that if they stayed too long, they'd be next. Same kind of idea. Now, the idea here is to have your internal users see the new release first and then have the customers see the old version. So if your internal employees test it and everything seems good, then you can point the general public to that same environment. And you can even partition it out so your public users are, you can take a small subset of your public users and have them go to the new release and the rest of them stay with the stable release. So in this instance, we're sending 5% of Global Manix traffic to the new release and then 95% of them are on the stable one. And what you can do is, is kind of watch that environment. This requires a lot of observability, by the way. But you can watch that environment, see if there are problems, and then kind of slowly shift all of the traffic over into the new environment. And then finally, feature flags is another option. This is where you have the same environment and the same code deployed, but each feature is only flagged in the software itself for certain people. Again, we'll have features that are turned on for internal employees first, but not the general public. So as we test the feature and find no problems, we can turn that feature on for a percentage of the public, again, and eventually the whole public. Now, what this does is it allows you to roll back changes when things go wrong. And to explain feature flags a little bit further, it's basically you'll have the feature in your software and the software itself will have a flag, whether it says this is on or off for this group. So this is mostly a, a thing that has to be done by the software developers. And it allows you to quickly roll things back when things go wrong. So a great benefit of it is if your server environment is under a high load also, you can turn that feature off for some users to reduce the load. So if you add a feature and this feature um, is something that involves video or something high load, and then all of a sudden you get traffic and you're like, this is completely being overloaded, let's turn it off for half the people. This is one of the things that you can do with feature flags. So these are just a few patterns that you can use to deliver your software after a successful deployment. And these patterns can be expensive, and as I said, they require good observability. You have to be able to look into all of your processes in your server and things like that. If you're going to have two different environments, you definitely want a way to compare those two environments with each other. So your organization may not implement these patterns, but there's something to keep in mind if you're running high traffic, busy applications. So here are our action items. We want to reduce our batch size create high fidelity environments, and automate their creation. We want to enable self-service so that anyone can create environments and do deployments. We want to automate testing, 
deployment, and integration. And then finally, determine what release looks like for you. Using these tools, you can create deployments faster with much less risk. You'll be able to push out features quickly and then roll them back if things go wrong. So I would like to say sincerely thank you. Thank you for attending this webcast and supporting us because without eager technologists wanting to learn, uh, we wouldn't be here. So I really appreciate everybody coming today and we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Okay, and our first question is, if we're making one deploy per task, how do we avoid deploying something that has a dependency on the next task? And the answer to that is there are some that have to be grouped together. So ideally, you would want to have you know, one single feature that's pretty autonomous that you can just create the task for it, create that feature, push it out, and everything's great. Um, it's not exactly realistic in most cases. A lot of times you'll have, for instance, you'll have a front-end change in your front-end framework, and then you'll have a change to the database, maybe the back-end, things like that, and, and those have to be kind of tied together. So that's one thing that that you know you you definitely want to try to get one deploy per task but it's not always possible what would be some branching strategies you would recommend is the next question and some of the branching strategies that i've really liked are when you stick with a trunk so let's say you have a trunk release and then you have a dev branch and that dev branch goes off and the dev branch will be pushing to um, staging or testing or I'm sorry, not staging, <laughs> it'll be testing or development. So any commits to the dev branch go to go to uh, development and testing, and then those get merged back into master. Once they're merged into master, they'll, they'll be pushed to staging and then have somebody push to production. But the best answer is probably it depends. And the tough thing with branching strategies is you it takes a long time to test them, so it's hard to see when they're working or not. But I, I think probably keeping it simple and doing like trunk-based development is one of my personal favorite ones. And the next question is, how do you get the business to buy into this when they prefer to only release every few months? <clears throat> and that is definitely um, a human problem as opposed to a tech problem. And so one of the things is probably just if you're able to I, and first, I should preface this by saying that some businesses can release every few months and be perfectly fine. If that's the case, then wanting to push more just because everybody else is doing it um, may not be a great use of time and effort. But let's say there are some problems. The best way is is to build that use case and go in and say, look, on our, our last deployment, you know, it took us this many hours. We thought it was going to be a quick, easy deployment. We ended up staying here all weekend. Um, you had to pay us or you had to drive us crazy through this whole weekend and basically build the case that if you're releasing these big batch releases and things are breaking, that it's, it's putting the company at risk, it's costing money and kind of present that package that if you break things down and release more, that you can mitigate some of those problems. So you basically just have to create that business case and you have to be able to prove that you're able to do that. So if you can create some kind of experiment their, your company will say, we're gonna to try to do it this way and then have that to be able to present to leadership and say, um, look how great it worked when we tried it. And the next question is, what are the common practices to control costs related to self-service resources? So that is a very good question um, because one of the things that you'll see when you have these self-service resources is somebody will go to the Jenkins server spin up a VM, use it, close it down, forget about it, spin up another one, close it, use it, forget about it. Or they'll spin one up that um, you know, has eight gigs of RAM and four CPUs and it's something to run a, a React application or something. So one of the best ways to control costs is to um, put some constraints on the developers. You know, Say that basically if you can do some analysis, figure out exactly how many machines they need, um, to use to do their job and limit them to that. Say that you can only create two VMs, um, they can only have this much RAM, this much CPU. You'll find a little resistance from developers because they're they're gonna want more and, and want to be able to do more. But the best way is, um, and I know a lot of uh, things like Jenkins is the one that I brought up, you are able to control how big the, the uh, 
be virtual machines are and so that will help with resources you can control how many they can they can create and then you know at some point you can say well if you need more please come and ask me uh, but that's probably the best way because th it does get expensive very fast the next question for this to work what would be a suitable landscape can this be done for an it shop with a lot of mainframe COBOL, non-distributed code um, i do think it could be done that way especially if say you have no intention of moving away from this old legacy technology and that's fine because if it's working and it's keeping the business running then there is no way or there is no really good reason to just deprecate it and say we need to go to the cloud or we need to do this um, but I, th I think it can be done for a smaller shop using some of these older technologies and most of that's going to be tied into the automation so it's going to be the the skills of the engineers on your team and how they're able to automate so if it's an old even old dos machines you can write batch files to automate things and so the key there would be for automation you're not going to have um, a lot of the newer devops um, technologies that you use a lot of the packages probably aren't going to work with cobol very well however if you come up with your own automation strategy um, step back and say this is what we need to do and this is why we need to do it um, and then figure out ways to automate it like i said with batch code um, or maybe even COBOL code, you could write COBOL applications that will do some of this automation for you. And the next question is, do you think that containerizing your environment makes a noticeable impact on a no impact release strategy? I, I do think containerizing helps a lot. Um, it solves the problem that we talked about with environments. That's, that's pretty much the big selling point of containers is we don't have to worry about environments anymore. We have this application that runs in this thing and we we can move it all over the place and not have to worry what version of Python's installed or, or what kernel we're using. So I, I do think it makes a noticeable impact. I didn't wanna focus on it as much with this webinar because I think it's just kind of implied that it's it's a lot of the processes are similar. And I think that within certain companies containerizing can make a big difference especially if it if it's something where you're using a lot of small services and and i hate to talk about the cliche microservices but if you're using microservices those go together with containers so well um, that that it'll definitely make a noticeable impact not every uh, organization can benefit from containerization but many of them can if you're able to do it and i i do think it makes a noticeable impact on your release strategy. And the next question is what and how governance can be done prudently in this structure or is it even required or advisable? And for that, I would say that some of it is self done. So if you have like things like compliance that you're worried about, um, that's where the logging comes in. And I mentioned trying to log everything, logging your deploys, logging your moves. Um, a lot of that for IT and um, IT auditing and compliance, some of that stuff actually becomes built in after a while. So you can do it prudently. However, there there are some challenges with you know developers being able to create their own machines and some of the things being kind of willy nilly. But the more things you automate and then log, the more things that are kind of predictable and tracked. If that makes any sense. And so how do you use a deployment strategy like you showed when configuration differences are needed inside the builds themselves, i.e. app settings, JSON files require different configurations depending on environments? And that one is a really good question. That one I have seen several times. And so you do have to make some exceptions a lot of the time. So one of the things that I mentioned was storing the configuration as code for production and then replicating that and using it but there there are times where you're using things like you're connecting to different databases or you're using different certificates there are small exceptions but i think what you need to focus on the most are the core settings like say if you have an asp.net server your asp.net configuration your iis configuration those things should be the same as much as possible um, if they're not then one of another thing that you can do is separate the build so you can have it to building your binaries and it's the same binaries moving through both of those things but some things like the app settings json might be a different part of it or some config files are different 
And so you can kind of split it up. It makes it a little bit more complex, but if it's something that you have to do, um, then that, that's something that's entirely possible. And it depends on the tools that you're using for your CI. And the next question is, what's your view on tools like X release or something similar to help orchestrate releases? If these turn out to be expensive for my org, what options do we have? I have never used X release, but as far as release orchestration, um, my view on that is if you have a large enough organization, it's almost required to have some sort of orchestration. So if you're a smaller shop, um, let's say you have a website or even 10 websites and you have developers working on each of those or you have, let's say, less than 50 applications, you can probably coordinate your releases without much help. And so it wouldn't be really worth the money to to buy some big orchestrator but if you're in an organization where you have hundreds of applications hundreds of different things in all different areas orchestration is almost necessary because you'll you'll run into that where things are just kind of flying all over the place and they're not coordinated with each other and somebody's pushing something over here and and that's when the the multiple releases that we're talking about that's where it kind of comes back to bite you right so if you have 10 different development teams and they're all releasing multiple times a day and things start to clash with each other um, and everybody keeps releasing keeps going that's when an orchestration comes in very handy so if they turn out to be too expensive for your org so you can't afford something for orchestration um, the best options you have at that point are to just try to to build it in-house and that's um, probably not the best answer out there but um, a lot of times like I'd mentioned I've, I've worked for big giant companies with endless resources small startup companies and when you're working in smaller companies basically you try to build a version of what that is for your group and that's um, sometimes very very difficult to do but doing as much as you can in-house and and one thing that personally I've fallen back on a lot as I mentioned is bash and PowerShell um, if you can't afford something for automation or something like that, you can do absolute wonders with Bash, PowerShell, Python, scripting, things like that. Um, just taking the time to learn that and get really good at it. It's, it's amazing some of the things that you can build out of those. Okay, um, so my final thoughts are keep learning. So I don't remember who said it, but they said if you're alert, you're either a learning organization or you're losing to someone that is. So keep learning, not only learning the skills required to do a lot of this stuff, which are the technical skills and things like that, but try to learn and, and make experiments about your organization and about your deployments. So do experiments, see if they work, see if they don't work, and try to learn and, and make it so that your whole organization is learning and moving in that direction. So just kind of never stop learning. Um, you know, learn PowerShell, get good at PowerShell, but also learn uh, your domain knowledge, how your how your deployments operate, how they work, and um, never stop learning. <laughs>